Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley is holding a press conference this afternoon and is expected to address the situation regarding the rise in COVID-19 cases and deaths in Trinidad and Tobago. Of course, we're bringing you live coverage on TTT, Talk City 91.1 FM, Suite 100.1 FM, Next 99.1 FM, and on Facebook at TTT Live Online. The press conference will be from the Diplomatic Center in St. Anne's. And while we await the Prime Minister, let's just give you this latest update from the Ministry of Health. 67 additional persons have tested positive for COVID-19. The Ministry of Health says the 67 positive cases reported show results from samples taken during the period September 2nd to September 12th, 2020. Therefore, this figure is not representative of the positive cases over the last 24 hours only. The total number of samples which have tested positive at public and private facilities in Trinidad and Tobago stands at 2,892. Now, out of that number, 2,076 are active cases. The number of deaths stands at 50. 766 persons have been discharged. COVID-19 positive patients in hospital stands at 113. 1,768 patients have been home isolated under the continuous monitoring of the respective County Medical Officer of Health offices. 67 new patients will be processed for admission at the discretion of the CMOH. And of course, the Prime Minister announced further restrictions on August 15th in Trinidad and Tobago for 28 days in the first instance. Now, those restrictions were to last until September 13th. Of course, these included all in-house dining at restaurants and bars and food courts were ceased. Beaches and rivers were closed. All places of worship were closed. All gyms were also closed. All contact sports were stopped. All water parks were closed. Casinos and members' clubs were also closed. The closure of cinemas and gatherings reduced to no more than five people. Weddings, funerals, no more than 10 people. Maxi taxis and taxis were to go back to 50% capacity. All teaching institutions were closed until December 31st. And of course, we go across now to the Diplomatic Center in St. Anne's, where the Prime Minister is holding a press conference. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, members of the media present here, and members of the national community at home and abroad, and those of you viewing and listening on the various platforms. Welcome to our weekend update on our COVID and other issues at this time. Today I have with me members of the Health Department crew and the Minister of National Security. I would today ask the Minister to give us the international briefing first and then Dr. Parasam will give us our local briefing and then they come back to me and we'll have a response to what they would have said to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Ladies and gentlemen of the media, good afternoon, and to the listening and viewing public wherever you are, good afternoon. Uh, so the scale of the global pandemic is showing little signs of slowing down. As of the latest figures, there are now 28,855,937 cases worldwide. So very soon we'll be we'll be talking about the 30th million case very soon. Deaths are currently at 922,672. Again, very soon, I'll be bringing the news to you that the world is recognizing this millionth death. These are not very good figures. Um, globally, the number of average cases per day, again, shows little or no signs of slowing down. Actually, it has actually increased up to August 29th, which is when I have the last figures for the rolling seven-day average. Before, there were about 
250,000 to 275,000 cases a day. Now they are actually increasing above 300,000 cases per day globally. And this is up to August 29th. Deaths, which tend to lag um, the increase in cases, had slowed down around May, June. Then they picked up around July, August. And deaths are now around uh, 6,000 uh, deaths per day globally. So that's where we are with the international picture. Regionally, and this is nothing to celebrate, but this is just to understand what is happening regionally. I just referred to an article in today's Express. 93rd COVID death in Suriname and toll rises in three more nations. So the region, as a CARICOM region, from far south as Suriname up to far north as Jamaica, we are not being spared. Um, I just want to quote something that my colleague, who I speak to off and on from Jamaica, the Minister of Health, Dr. Christopher Tufton. Because we are in the same boat together. And he said, Jamaica is now in the community transmission phase of COVID-19. And this is the time when our resources will have to shift to monitoring the spread and characteristics of the virus, identifying and managing severe cases, preventing onward transmission. And I think I will sound repetitive here now, alleviating strains on healthcare services, informing the public, and reducing overall social and economic impact. So globally, there is no sign of slowdown. Regionally, there is little sign of slowdown, especially in the parameters of deaths. While we have recorded our 50th death, and our deepest condolences go out to these families again. Our death rate, in speaking to Dr. Michel Trotman, Dr. Hines, CMO, is well below international standards. I mean, that is nothing to celebrate because 50 families and communities are in mourning. So, Prime Minister, that's where we are globally. That's where we are regionally. We just ask the population to once again adhere to all the guidelines we have put out and we still maintain that our strategic objective at the Ministry of Health is to return to cluster spread, taking the country back from community spread to cluster spread in the shortest space of time. Thank you very much, Honorable Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Minister. Could we hear from Dr. Paris from now on the situation with respect to Trinidad and Tobago? Thank you, Honorable Prime Minister, Honorable Ministers, members of the media, members of the viewing and listening public, our daily update for September 12, 2020 is as follows. Our sample submitted thus far 26,551. Unique patient tests 23,508. Number of repeated tests 3,043. Number of samples which have tested posit positive are now 2,892. This represents approximately 0.21% of our population meaning that 99.7, roughly, percent of our population is still naive to this virus. In terms of total number of active cases, we now have 2,076. Number of deaths, as Minister said, now stands at 50. Number of persons discharged, 766. 67 additional persons would have tested positive in this morning's 10 a.m. update. In terms of our facilities at the Coover Hospital and Multi-Training Facility, we have 80 persons now. Five persons in ICU, four in the high dependency unit. At Cora, there are 29 persons at the Arima General Hospital. We have four individuals. In terms of step down, at our UE Deby campus, we have 77, seven persons. UE Canada Hall, 44. UE Freedom Hall, there are 68. The other step down facilities remain vacant at this point in time. Within the quarantine centers, the home of football, there are four persons. Chancellor Hotel 17, Cascadia 6, Region Star 30, I believe at the Paria Suite we were able to decant 94 individuals yesterday and we are expecting a group of 90 plus again sometime later this, today. In terms of our, if Prime Minister you will allow me just a minute, I'll ask Dr. Trotman to give us a little brief update as to what is happening in the hospitals with our patients. She will speak a little bit about what we have spoken before regarding silent hypoxia and what it means for the persons at home in particular, um, and how to recognize symptoms and signs of deterioration. 
Dr. Trotman. Honorable Prime Minister, Ministers, members of the viewing public, members of the health community, first off, my deepest condolences to all 50 families that have suffered loss. I would like to give an overview of what the COVID patient sometimes experiences very briefly, um, particularly as it relates to patients who require oxygen. Many of our patients who have COVID uh, suffer with problems that will make their oxygen levels low. And you know, as you know, oxygen is a fuel. That's what we need for energy. And patients, when they don't have oxygen, become less, less tired, may have symptoms, shortness of breath, chest tightness. But once they get oxygen, those feelings go away. And patients begin to feel that they are okay. They feel very comfortable. And unfortunately, what we have seen with a couple of our patients, a number of our patients, is as they begin to receive this oxygen and they begin to feel better, is they take the oxygen off. And when they take the oxygen off, what happens is the cells that require it, unfortunately, suffer and can die. And we've seen that some of our patients who have been one of those, some of those 50 have done that even while their oxygen requirements were very high, they took their oxygen off and eventually suffered demise and compromise. So I wanna say first off to people out there that you, 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 you have the opportunity lots of times to be communicating with your relatives. They sound okay. You might not be able to pick up that they're okay. They may not, I might be able to. The caregivers are there. They are encouraging. But they feel okay and they take it off. Encourage people that if they are in the hospital and they need, the doctor has prescribed oxygen, then keep it on. Do not take it off. That's, that's one of the biggest messages I can give. The other thing is the, the numbers. I know we are all alarmed at this number 50 that we have gotten to with our deaths. And it is too much. One, one was, one was, one was too, too many. But when we look at our total numbers, overall, we fall below the average. We fall below the international average, and well so. We hope that we have no more or no more deaths, but it is quite possible. I want to say to the healthcare team, the healthcare givers out there, the ones who are doing this fight, thank you so much. I know how they feel when they have to call and report a death. And I know you feel that it's not our relatives, but it's a loss for us. Because what we take is a motto. What we take is a motto really to save lives. Um, yeah? Prime, Prime Minister, if, if you will allow me, before Dr. Trotman leaves, please explain to the population what happy hypoxia is and what a happy hypoxic patient is. Well, it's just as, as, as the word says, that when, you, when, 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 you, when you drop your oxygen, actually you have a period there where you, you get and you feel like you're okay and you're happy, but it's not good. Okay, so, and they do want me to emphasize that uh, when, when you feel like you have symptoms or even if you don't feel like you have symptoms, please reach out to us. There are many, many avenues. Um, that the doctors have and your nurses healthcare has for us to reach out to you Let us know that you're not feeling well some reason, some some ways that you can tell so you can't catch your breath You can't finish your sentence your chest feels tight. Those are some of the things and always please remember to distance Sanitize and use your vaccine wear your mask. Thank you Thank you very much dr. Parson and dr. Uh, Trotman. I too would like to join my colleagues up here and members of the health fraternity who are directly on the firing line, seeing, touching, experiencing the demise of persons day after day. Fifty in the context of the almost one million persons in the world. It's a small number, but it's a big number at the personal level. It is somebody's father, somebody's grandfather, 
somebody's uncle, somebody's neighbor, some community's respected and loved person. And every time someone passes on from this virus, it ought not to be seen as arithmetic, just a number. It's a community and a nation at the loss and in pain. I've seen it said from impressive platforms that this is like the flu. It is not. It is certainly not in very many ways. And I'm sure if the doctors were to stand at the platform and tell you how it is different, you would see. But you would also have seen some of the patients, local and foreign, who would have told you about how horrible the experience is. And of course, persons passing on at this time, there's the additional trauma of the rest of us in the national community not being able to see them off in the way we have been accustomed to, to bring closure to their passing. That too is very painful. I myself have experienced that with my eldest brother who didn't pass from COVID, but he passed during the time when a funeral, which is our way of treating with the passing, is now involving only less than a dozen people. So every time I see a passing of someone, I know there's a family going through what I've been through. And you also would have heard Dr. Parasram say that there are over 99% of a population that is naive, meaning have not had the body experience the virus. Remember, this virus is a microbe which has not been in the human population before. It has come into the human population and it is starting to make its mark. Where that mark is going to be left, we still don't know. We know what it's doing. But what we do know is that we are having to continue to try to live with it, to fight it, and to cause it not to overcome us. Well, how is that likely to happen? Because if 99% of the population has not been exposed to it, and upon becoming exposed to it, you either react by being mildly ill or not being ill at all, or you progress to death. How do we live with this virus, and how do we get the better of it? We have come up with the plan, and the only plan that's available to the human population is to try and prevent the virus from spreading. Because if it is prevented from spreading, it will wither in terms of its numerical strength and will be reduced and the expectation and the, 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 the vision and the want is that it becomes absent by having not propagated itself to continue as a micro. And the way we do that are through the restrictions that we've placed on ourselves. Those restrictions are our only tool. The restriction to not gather. That is why half of the public service is at home, so that those bodies which ordinarily would have been in taxis, on the street, in the office, elsewhere, additional bodies, the government has taken out half of its labor force so as to not have the virus have these stepping stones. In the private sector, they've made a lot of adjustments as to how those in the workplace are spaced out, so that even though we're carrying on with some work and some production, that the virus is denied. If we follow the protocols, the virus is denied the opportunity to jump from one person to the other. A person who is carrying the virus and is not demonstrating any symptoms and is present as healthy and normal would have saved the population, the spread, if that person had followed the protocols, passed through the period when they're infectious and gone to a period when they're no longer infectious. But that can only happen if we deny the virus the space. 
And that is why it is so important for the little thing of spacing yourself out. And of course, in transmission of the virus, we want you to wear the mask so that droplets and aerosols coming from person to person would be eliminated or reduced. Those are the two things that are required for human population to do to deny the virus that stepping stone, that jumping off from one person to the other. We've said that so many times. The minister has said it a thousand times. Dr. Parson has said it two thousand times. <laughs> I've said it a hundred times on this platform. And I'm still trying to understand why there are people in Trinidad and Tobago who firstly believe that God's going to give us a pass and this virus that is heading to 30 million people in the world will not bother us and will not bother me and I could do as I please and like the frog on the hill, I have the rights to deny this and the rights to be condemned. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very serious matter. I remember saying this when we had no death. I remember saying it when we had the first death. I'm now saying it when we have the 50th debt, and I don't want to have to say it when we have 100 or 500. Because let me tell you this, it is not locking down. There's no key to lock down and get rid of the virus. If the numbers become ridiculously high and we are forced to go back to a lockdown, the lockdown in itself does not eliminate the virus. What it does is slow down the spread to reduce the effect of the virus on you. It doesn't eliminate it. Because after the lockdown, you're going to have to come out again and be where we are right now. And if when we lock down and we come out here and we start over again, all we are doing is repeating the effect of the virus. So you can lock down four, five, six times if you wish. It's just as bad or worse than the first lockdown. Because if after the first lockdown, we do what has to be done in a disciplined way, that is our best chance to not have to lock down again and to keep the virus at bay. You would have heard the minister say that our next target is to move from community spread to cluster, meaning that we are trying to roll back to a point where cluster would be an accomplishment, would be a better position. Recall when we were in this sporadic phase and we went to cluster, and now we are at community spread. If we get back to cluster, it would be an improvement, but we'd still be living with the virus. And that is why I've said to my colleague, the Minister of National Security, while it is not feasible to lock up everybody who's playing the fool and who's breaking the law or breaching the regulations, we really only have left serious, sustained law enforcement because there are people in this community who only understand the heavy hand. As Prime Minister, I said to you in the beginning, we did not accept the advice of persons to have a state of emergency and remove the police, the, the power of the police to be constrained by the Constitution and allow the police to act without control because it was not going to improve the position of the individual to at the personal level, respond to the virus. So those who advise us to have a state of emergency because it was serious, it, to them, the existence or the declaration of a state of emergency would have indicated how serious it was. But to us and to the Ministry of Health, it would not really have changed the circumstance of what is required of the individual. To those who understand that it is an ailment, two things. One. There is no treatment to give you a cure for the virus that we have now. That may come later, but as of now, we don't have a treatment that we can, you can be treated, you get better, you go home from the hospital. And secondly, the, va the vaccine that we are anxiously awaiting from all reports, it is not around the corner. It's not here next month. It's not here, by, not even by Christmas. Because the best scientific labs in the world, notwithstanding every now and then you hear somebody has a vaccine, the WHO is not advising us that there's a vaccine on the horizon of a matter of months 
we are still awaiting the scientific breakthrough and of course the tests that will prove to the scientists that the vaccine is safe because you can have vaccines but vaccines have to be efficacious and safe we're not there yet we can't cater for that in the meantime what that means we are having to live with a virus that is very detrimental to human beings I said to my colleague where Trinidad and Tobago is we expect that there would be firm and sustained law enforcement for those who believe that the only thing that they will accept and respond to is being restrained by a police officer and as I say that let me join the conversation now in Trinidad and Tobago we expect that the law will be applied to every person regardless of race color creed class or social standing because those who believe that they are beyond the reach of this virus you could say so for yourself and that may suit you in comforting your irresponsible conduct but in so doing you pose a threat to the rest of our national community to the little children who are helpless and require the behavior of adults to be such that give them a chance to the persons with underlying medical conditions who require those who are well and moving around to behave responsibly to those elder citizens who are depending entirely on not being exposed in the simplest way to this virus they request through me to the Minister of National Security to the police service that you ensure that there's an improvement in the conduct of our nationals where the law applies across the board especially to those for whom priority is partying persons who are partying and spreading this virus must feel the full brunt of the law in Trinidad and Tobago this is not for me to tell the Commissioner of Police who to arrest and who not to arrest or how to apply the law but as Prime Minister I could tell the Commissioner of Police that the law must apply to protect us in Trinidad and Tobago from those who are not prepared to listen and not prepared to fight the fight that we want to fight to bring this virus under control we can do no more but we'll do the most with what we have I had a meeting with my CARICOM colleagues um, yes. couple of, yesterday. We had a fairly long meeting, CARICOM heads, on this matter of how we relate to the external community and how we consider opening our borders. Um, countries like St. Lucia, Barbados, Grenada, where they are entirely dependent on the borders being open so that they, their, their tourism economy can begin to receive people and the bulk of the conversation had to do with the logistics of treating with persons who would want to come to us to the extent that there are people who want to travel and they come to us how do we treat with them as we live with the virus and that their presence not become a threat to us what can we put in place to allow them to come and be here contributing to the economies but at the same time not contributing to our demise some of the reports we've had are, they're very they're, they're different models that we considered some people are requiring or everybody at this point in time is requiring that some element of testing be done in other words determine who comes to you so either you test before you come and some persons will require you test on arrival or you come without a test and when you come you must be tested and also the question of quarantine and what happens if there are breaches or if there are failings in that system and so on at the end of that very long conversation the conclusion was that we are not in a position to open our borders fully or at all in some instances for those countries who have opened their borders there are some very strict uh, requirements and they're selective as to who comes in and from where depending on where um, how the virus is raging in different areas um, those countries like Trinidad and Tobago where we are at community spread and where the persons coming to us are likely to come from an area where the virus is uh, um, very prevalent we still have to maintain that closed border so the question of 
the social distancing, the sanitizing, the wearing of the mask, and the closed border, these are all our defense shields in the face of a virus which, as the minister has told you, is not abating, but in fact, we are seeing it increasing around the world. The question is, when does it end? We don't know. What does it do to us? Nothing good. How do we respond? In the ways that we have described. And what do we expect? We expect that we would, if we are disciplined, we will continue to work, in some instances, at reduced levels. We'll continue to take some elements of risk without being reckless. But it's hurting us. It's hurting our economy terribly. Yesterday I had a meeting with the Minister of Finance and it is our view that this virus has cost us, um, and this is not the money we've borrowed and spent to pay for the response. It is losses because the economy has not acted in the way it would normally have acted. We, we, we in Trinidad and Tobago, we probably would have lost about $10 billion from our economy because we were not able to do a normal day during the period that we are fighting this virus. Of course, our $10 billion is a drop in the ocean of the losses worldwide. I mean, some of the numbers are staggering around the world as to what, is, what the losses are. And some of those losses bounce back to us here because they have not created markets that are attractive for our product. They have not, yeah, I'm being told by the minister that WHO estimates that the global loss is 375 billion US dollars per month. per month. And this has been going on since what, February? Yeah. So you can understand what it is that this virus is doing to us, not just causing deaths in the way that it's being reported, but it's having a huge impact on our livelihoods because of the shutdowns, the reductions, the market collapses, and so on. And I need not go into the whole question of the loss of business and the loss of jobs that are, that are taking place and that will continue to be a feature of the local, regional, and international economy until this virus recedes into the past. So this is a period of great uncertainty, great harm, and a period that is calling for resolve to survive it. There has to be a resolve. 375 billion US dollars per month is something that I'm not in, in my understanding of history. This has never happened before in human condition, never. So therefore, let us understand what we're dealing with, and that is why those who see this as a joke and those who are prepared to push the envelope to see what they can get away with. This is what we all have to deal with and we are calling for a responsible conduct. I look forward to the week, months, the weeks and months ahead where I could report to you that the national community is rising to the occasion, rising to the challenge, doing the simple things, being serious and being responsible at the personal level and of course for those who believe that they have to put their finger in the wound to feel it, that the pain is there for them to experience that. So ladies and gentlemen, today is the end of the period that we had asked for when we said that we would roll back uh, for that cycle to allow us to respond in the way we have responded in the last month. And given where we are at, we could take some comfort that our situation has not worsened. Because had we not acted, it certainly would have worsened and worsened to a considerable level. We are not in a position today to say that the statistics, um, maybe I should ask Dr. Hines to tell us where we are with respect to the statistical outcome of our experiment of our recent rollback.
Thank you, Prime Minister. Good afternoon to the Honourable Ministers, to my colleagues, to the media, and to the viewing and listening public. As you would know, we are now 28 days in from the original uh, beginning of the restrictions, the measures to reduce gathering, reduce the rates at which the virus is able to meet new people, uninfected people, and infect them. And what we have seen is that although we are in that accelerating phase of uh, any pandemic, the measures are beginning to appear as though we might be seeing some success. We have not seen the slowing that, you, that we're hoping to see down the back end of the curve, down that other side of the bell that we've been describing. But we are beginning to see signs that fewer and fewer people on our daily, uh, daily counts, not the ones that show up in the press releases that may have uh, numbers across a few days, but on the daily counts, we're starting to see where those numbers are starting to look a little more favorable, although they're still increasing. So it's at, we're at the point where we are encouraged to hold the course. We're encouraged to continue what we're doing because while we are applying what may seem to be a slow breaking force, we're slowing that sort of runaway train that a, a pandemic can be we are not out of the woods. So what we need to do is continue to apply that breaking force in the hope that the data continues to show us the trend towards some sort of ease, some, a trend towards some sort of deceleration. As we progress, as we have additional data, we will show that in our weekly uh, press conferences with the graphics to suit, and you'll have a better idea, a better grasp of what we're describing. Thank you, Dr. Hines. Um, so, that being the case, we are living with a condition where with 99% of the people available for infection, providing, uh, assuming that those who have been infected will not be infected again. As long as we have one or two people, or a few people, in that population of 99% of the population, as long as you have some people in there who are designated spreaders or accidental spreaders, the situation is that the virus could be spreading amongst us. That is why it's so important that we place our expectation and our hopes on the personal conduct in denying the virus, the person-to-person -person conduct. And because we have not seen the level of reduction that we want to see to allow us to have the level of risk that we want to take, we must continue to do what we have been doing so as to get the result that we are after. So therefore, Today, I will simply ask that we continue up until another cycle to the 28th, to the 28th, to the 11th of, to the 11th of October, the stay-at-home arrangements for the public service would remain, the rotations would remain, and with one adjustment where, because, as I said, we have to continue to do what we have to do, livelihood, lives and livelihood, remember those two terms. We are in the budget period. The budget is due. Um, the date has been given, October 5th. All persons in the public service who are required to work on the budget exercise in every ministry and the Ministry of Finance, you are deemed here to be essential and you're required to be at work, and I would leave that to the head of the public service to talk to the permanent secretaries in the various ministries to ensure that the persons to whom this, this stay at home applies are not those persons who are required to be at work to assist with the budget preparation. And by this I mean the Ministry of Finance and the finance people in the various ministries. They are now deemed to be essential and would be required to be at work so that the budget can be prepared 
and we go to the parliament on October 5th and do that assignment because um, so much re relies on us getting the budget through the parliament, getting the legal allocation to service the country and to continue to conduct our business um, with some order and some positivity. The best positivity we've had, I must at this stage congratulate our cricketers, TKR, and all our regional cricketers and all our guests who came, and who proved us correct that we could have, in a pandemic, create the health environment, which is loosely called a bubble, so that the business of international professional cricket could have taken place. I think we should take comfort from that, saying that even though the virus is there, even though the difficulty and the threats are there, it is possible to construct an environment in which we can continue to do the things that we normally would do. The same thing, I went to a couple of factories a few weeks ago, and the factory floor was humming along with work going on. People were coming out to work. There were a significant number of adjustments that they had made as to how the staff moves, where they eat, how they are deployed in the factory floor, but work was going on and outputs were coming from the factory. That is what we have to do. That's what we have to do. We can't just fall back and say that, well, there's a pandemic and we throw hands up in the air and, you know, let it get the better of us. What that cricket has demonstrated, that it is possible to get it done, but to do so successfully, you have to have the discipline to follow the advice. And I must say the advice was followed yep. and the outcome was very satisfactory and the processes were flawless. So let us let that template be a model for us. Um, the other thing that we've done, we did consult with the public transport, the private transport personnel, um, the 12-seater, 18-seater, 24-seater maxis, and we have come up with an arrangement which I am told would be attached to the regulations, which is a, a map of the internals of the vehicles which show how they can be seated, how passengers can be seated. So you get a little more, but you also get the social distancing um, and the, who has that? The Minister of Health has it. So like for example, a 12-seater maxi would carry eight people, um, was it um, one per window, a, a, 12, a, a 18 seat maxi would carry a bit more, a 25 seat maxi would carry a bit more, but they would all be specifically seated in certain seats in the vehicle, and that will allow them, I think, to get to a 65 percent level, as against as, as against a 50 percent level, and we will um, we will continue with that. So other than that, all the arrangements remain in place. Um, I know we attempted to want to go to the beaches and the rivers. Let us hold on a bit, and. Um, today is the 12th of, so we will maintain this posture for another month and uh, um, by the 28th we will review, but, but by, by the 28th we will be halfway there, that's another, four, another 14 day period and we will have to do another review then, hopefully all things being equal all disciplines and protocols being observed. By the 28th, we will have a view which will give us what the month of September looked like, and we can compare September with August, and we will then have um, the other 14-day period going into October. If any adjustments can be made then, we would consider it then, but as of now, we are not um, minded to make any adjustments to what we are doing, except to say, let us continue to have livelihoods within the constraints of the protocols which are to be rigorously enforced. So if there are any questions, any, uh, we will take them now. And we have all the doctors here. And we have the doctors here and we have the Minister of National Security. So any questions which would be appropriate for any of us here, please put them now. Dr. Heinz.
Um, you mentioned that you all are looking at the numbers, the daily figures, and it seems to be um, fluctuating, sometimes lower than, than, than other days. Um, what exactly are you all looking for right now in terms of the numbers per day before we can lift the restriction? Okay, the expected behavior in a pandemic situation of a virus passing through a population is that it starts off slowly, it picks up speed, it gets to a maximum and it starts to slow down. So what we are hoping to see with the data is that we see continuing decreases in the numbers of new cases. We're not looking at a specific figure. We're not looking for a specific percentage. What we're looking at is a trend, a continuing downward trend that is supporting the understanding that the measures that we have been taking have managed to slow the movement of virus from one person to another to the stage where fewer than one person per new infected case becomes infected on the other side of the curve. When we get that R naught down to below one, where you start seeing fewer cases being uh, accum accumulating, we know that we're heading in the right direction. It's not that we have a specific threshold, a specific number, a specific date. It is an onward trend that we look at as it fluctuates, because you use the word, the word correctly. Those numbers will fluctuate, and we're looking at the overall trend to see that we're heading in the right direction, and it's a continuous monitoring process. I don't know if you have these figures on you, but could you give us an idea as to the numbers that we have had daily for the past two weeks or so? I don't have the figures on me. The highest number that we've seen daily uh, up to a couple of weeks ago was about 118. In spite of the fact you'd have seen larger figures in the daily updates, as we explained, those figures extend a few days beyond or before the update itself. And the figures since that have been a little lower. We're still monitoring. We're still making sure that the data set is complete. But as we monitor, we are getting encouraging signs that those numbers, the increases in those numbers, is, is becoming progressively smaller. And we're hoping to see the other side of the curve before we start claiming, OK, it's absolutely working. So continuous monitoring. We keep reviewing the data. We keep examining the data set to ensure we have it all and that we're making an assessment of all that is in our possession and at our disposal. And could you give us a, the, the lowest that you've seen? You've seen 118 being the highest. Mm -hmm. um, what's the lowest that we have seen? When? In the same period. In the same period, we have seen it between around 2030 it being one of the lower, at the lower end. Again, as we update, the figures can also be revised. The figures can change. But 20 to th at the early part of phase two, what we were seeing was 6, 8, 10, 14. And it continued, it began to increase at what we call that exponential rate. The exponential rate is not as steep now as it was previously, and we're hoping that that indicates that we are beginning to see success with the measures, so we continue to monitor. Uh, Dr. Hines, Rashad Khan, Guardian Media Limited. Um, would you happen to know offhand, or would you be in a position to give us an update on how many persons with uh, uh, in total were infected with comorbidities and how a percentage of those who would have died? I don't have all of that data in front of me, but that is something that we can actually okay. compile. I, and I, I do have some, some of that data, and Dr. Trotman will explain a little bit further. So, so far, we have calculated that over 90% of those who have died are over 60 with comorbidities. There are a couple just below that threshold of 60 years, 58, 59. So from, let's say, 58, 59 go up, over 90% of that 50 um, do, in fact, have comorbidities. Below that age, a couple of those obesity and so on, and I will now let Dr. Trotman go into some more detail because we are looking at that. Thank you for your question. The uh, spread that we have seen with all 50 patients do show a predominance of deaths in patients who present with comorbidities, um, most commonly hypertension, diabetes, and in some respects also obesity. Uh, some of the comorbidities that we are seeing frequently. I want to take the opportunity though that 
to, to emphasize that some patients, unfortunately, have comorbidities but do not know. And so they may present at the time of presentation with a comorbidity that they may have had but not previously diagnosed and not necessarily always diagnosed even at the time of presentation. We have seen uh, cases, other cases, where p patients do not have comorbidities but they are not the majority. We have seen a very few number of patients who are younger, very, very few, also without comorbidities, not predominant. What we're seeing is a more of a hypertensive, diabetic, elderly population with some form of comorbidity. Before, before you go to the next question, let me come back here to my pet peeve of the day. I would assume, I'm not a doctor, I'm not part of the health system, but I would assume that it is possible that a number of those persons would have got infected by somebody who brought the gift to them in a very unobserved and very healthy way. Because the way the numbers have been going worldwide, there are a lot of people, young and healthy, older and healthy, who are in fact in a position to infect older persons with comorbidity who would die from the infection. So it is important for us to notice that. And that's why we are appealing to those who are perceived to themselves or to others to be healthy and strong, that you may be threatening somebody's life by an exposure which could result in death. That's, that's what this virus is saying to us. So there's a large population of so-called healthy people who are in fact carrying the virus. And therefore, if you have older people at home and you're partying outside, you may be having a good time outside, but you could be the Grim Reaper when you get home. That is what it is all about. Oh, so no, therefore, it's important for us to, to be aware of that. I think it is important for me to step on the heels of that. It is so critical for us to understand that we all have a role to play, old, young, with or without comorbidities, and to understand that there's silence and silence would spread so that people who don't know it, strong and healthy, may have it and pass it to someone who does not have the ability to fight the way that you are. That's why it's a public health disease. That's why what you do is so important to others. Prime Minister, if, if you'll allow me to take the battle from where you passed it to Dr. Trotman, and I will now go one step further. And I waited for some time because I didn't want to impinge on patient confidentiality, and I am not going to. I will simply make a statement. There are a couple people who died, elderly, who we know from their history had no way of leaving their homes because they were incapacitated either physically or through mental disease. They never left their home for the past two years, but the virus went home and met them. And that is why I keep begging people, especially young people, you will take the virus home and you will literally pass it on to the elderly. The elderly didn't ask for this because that person, one or two who for physical incapacity or mental incapacity, never left their home for the past five years. The virus went home and met them and they died. So you may not be a doctor of medicine, <laughs> Prime Minister, but your doctorate gives you the ability to think. And we are asking the population to think before you engage in risky activity. Be responsible. Let's hear from Dr. Hines again, please. Okay, thank you, Prime Minister. I want to continue this metaphorical, really, and pick up the baton from the Minister. Uh, one of the things that we do have as medical professionals is lots of our own personal friends who would call and ask about what to do in given situations. And what you do see is something very similar. An elderly relative is ill. 
You're not sure why they would be ill. Testing in the family indicates, yes, they did contract COVID-19. And when you ask, okay, so what happened, uh, you know, in the last week or so, what was going on? Did you go anywhere? No. We had a little birthday party, a little family gathering. At this point, while that is normal and not considered, quote, unquote, risky behavior, anything that brings different webs of social circles together, no matter how small, is a risk. That's why we're asking people, whether you're in public or in your private settings, to avoid the gathering altogether. Because when you bring networks together, one person has it, they pass it to a whole new network, it can get, in, get into a whole new home. And this is what we're trying to avoid, this is what we're trying to advise people not to do. Part of the new normal is to reduce the risk of connecting networks and bringing virus home by reducing some of that social activity, at least for the short term. Prime Minister. Thank you. Let's get back to the questions again. Um, if you have any further questions, continue, please. Uh, it's a question to the Minister of National Security. Yeah, let's have the Minister of National Security at the podium. Right, Lala, TDT News. Uh, Minister, we talk about enforcement. How has enforcement been going with, the, with regards to public health regulations with the police service? Um, how many people have been charged for breaking quarantine uh, for the wearing of masks and so on? All right, I don't have those statistics here and I wouldn't want to venture, I guess. I mean, I have, I get reports over a period of time, but that can be provided. I'll ask the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service to, to pass that on. What I can tell you is there has been enforcement. As you heard the Prime Minister say, he's had a conversation with me. I, in turn, have had a conversation with the various heads of the police service or intelligence services or defense force and ask them to support the police service in increasing our enforcement measures so that you can expect to see that taking place. But we ask people, be personally responsible, especially for something like the mask wearing. I, I was a little distraught this week to see that we had crossed well over the 100 mark. I think it was 179 was told at the police conference of tickets being issued, and that could be avoided. Right, by persons just wearing their masks. Minister, before you leave the podium, for the public, for the benefit of the public, um, well, you're a lawyer by practice, but by profession, um, the national conversation in the last four, 24 hours has to do with whether, in fact, the, there is authority for the police to act okay. in private premises and so on, or, or, or common compounds, and also, there was a judgment that came out of the court yesterday, I think it was. Yes, it was. Which I've read the newspaper, one particular newspaper that screamed a certain headline. That was wrong. I've yes. had bits and pieces of the judgment read to me and um, for the public benefit. Could you clarify where we are on those two issues, please? Thank you very much, Brian. As a, speaking as a lawyer. <laughs> not protected by the cabinet privilege. <laughs> Thank you, Prime Minister. A, a place that I often wonder. Um, okay, let me start with the enforcement. There are a number of laws that are open to the police service, and, and in fact, one of them I was reading this morning, Section 133 of the Public Ordinance, the Public Health Ordinance, that allow the police service to intervene in circumstances where there's risk to other people's lives, and risk especially in a situation that we're in the pandemic. So the police can intervene in those circumstances, and it does not become a debate as to public or private. In fact, the commissioner had pointed it out in April of this year, and he was quite right in referring to it. Of course, the police will be very cautious as, as to getting involved into private property, as they rightly should be, and, but they do have jurisdiction, and in certain instances they can be invited by others to come into the jurisdiction the private jurisdiction and to enforce the law. So there are a number of common law as well, charges and common law offenses where they can be called upon to protect persons, as we know, if, if, if there's harm and there's harm's way. The conversation has been had with the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, and they will continue to enforce the law. They have been put in, in difficult circumstances. They will continue to do what they need to do. And as the Prime Minister said, and I'll just like to join him, in my view, I've always said no one is above the law, and the law applies to everyone. And you can't say, well, I'm, I'm in a private setting, so I can put everybody's lives at risk, and you, the police, have no jurisdiction over me. The police will not accept that. With respect to the judgment of Justice Budu Singh that came out yesterday, 
it is very incorrect for anyone to suggest that the regulations, the public health regulations, have been struck down. That's just not a fact. In fact, the court upheld that the public health regulations are not unconstitutional and they are intravirus within the, the law and that the government was quite right to continue to, to make these regulations. The only thing that the court struck down was in the last set of regulations, I think it kicked in from about regulation number 23, if I remember correctly, there began to be a reference. So, for example, in ecclesiastical settings, you can't have gatherings of more than 10, or if you're having certain things, they, are, they must be in conformity with the CMO's guidelines. And what the court found is that the guidelines were not part of the regulations. The guidelines were not attached to the regulations. There was not certainty in these protocols and guidelines. And to have a criminal offense, you must have certainty. So to, to tell someone that if you breach this, you, me, we must know it, what is it that we're going to breach to be charged with a criminal offense. So the court for, found that there was not enough certainty in the description. There was not enough certainty in what what is it being breached. As I was um, speaking to the Prime Minister a little earlier, for example, when it described churches, mosques, and, and, and religious gathering settings, they use a per square foot. But it didn't say, okay, if you have us next to each other, but we're still within the ratio of the square footage, then that becomes a criminal offense. And the law has a principle, you must have certainty, and if there's a breach of certainty, then it can be a criminal offense. So all the court found is, don't refer, to regul don't refer in the regulations to protocols and to guidelines by the Ministry of Health, so that will be rectified. But the court did hold, Prime Minister, that like they're seeing all over the world, especially in Commonwealth jurisdictions, the government could make the regulations that it did throughout to protect the population, and there was nothing unconstitutional with that whatsoever. So the regulations have been upheld as being legal and being not in breach of the Constitution. So while you're up there, right, I just want to put a question to you. So we're speaking now about continuing with the regulations and all the efforts that we are doing here now. Now it has been confirmed that this second phase of infection was due to illegal immigration, and that will continue to be uh, 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 a threat to us because that country which I came from is over 50,000 cases there. So what okay, let me just press a pause there. I don't know where you're getting that it was confirmed that the, next, the second wave we have came from illegal immigration. So I just want to debunk that straight away. What was suggested early o'clock is there seem to have been some of those early cases that may have had a link. But, I mean, I have been participating throughout with the Ministry of Health and the vast majority, there was no such link found whatsoever. So, go on. Okay, so even if it mm -hmm. wasn't the cause of this Correct. Go on. wave, it still poses a real threat to Correct. us and our efforts locally. So are we doing anything differently? What is the Ministry of National Security doing to, to, to delay that threat? All right, the first thing I'd like to say is all of the assets that we have are being deployed in that area, which is our border security. And as I keep reminding law enforcement, which includes the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service and Immigration and Customs, you now have a variety of things. Every person coming from Venezuela requires a visa. So anybody coming in, there's a breach without the visa. Then you have the regulations itself, and then our borders are closed. So we're doing all that we can. We're using our coastal radar system. We're using all of the assets. But I just want to say something. Yeah? This is not a phenomenon that Trinidad alone is facing. I've been following it very closely. If you go and look at international news, you will see, for example, the great United Kingdom, Great Britain is struggling with it. You're seeing the same thing on certain um, other European countries. So it is something that we're living with. Just last week, and I can say this, I had a, a meeting, a virtual meeting, with the authorities in Venezuela, the equivalent of the Ministry of, Minister of National Security, I think he's the Minister of Interior Defense and a whole set of generals and admirals, for us to ask the Venezuelan authorities to work along with us to ensure border security and border patrols on both sides of the border and to say that we require their assistance, we will provide them with intelligence, they can provide us with intelligence, and we'll do what we need to do. We are utilizing all of our Coast Guard assets. The Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, Immigration Service, Coast Guard, Defense Force are all working together. And we are trying to, to bring that border security up. Let me just intervene here a bit because I know this is a, 
a conversation that is very easy to have. We could take comfort in um, saying that the problem that we have Correct. is caused by Venezuelans coming to our border. I've seen it written and said over and over how porous the border is and we've left the south coast open and that sort of un, you know, usable statement. People can just say that and it sounds good. If only we close the border, we will not be. Because the, but the logic is if that is so, except for North Korea, there's no country in the world where one can say that the border is closed Completely. and nobody outside can come in and bring the virus. In uh, neighbors in Central America where they have land borders, in fighting this virus with their home, their, their, their domicile population and their land borders, yes, you're right, there is the threat, the potential for persons coming from across the border to bring to you the virus. And you talk about the population, the numbers in Venezuela, but what about the American-Mexican border? The largest, the, the, I think the, second, the largest number of infected people mm -hmm. are in the United States. We see a border with the United States in Florida. That's why Cal is not flying there in, in schedule. But we have to be careful that we don't take comfort in pseudoscience. Venezuelans in Trinidad and Tobago are exposed to the virus like every one of us. And Venezuelans coming here illegally, they pose a threat, and that's why we are keeping our monitoring up and ensuring that there's no um, yes. unchecked flow of Venezuelans coming here, or from anywhere for that matter. But we have to be careful. Right? If you cast your mind back to when AIDS became a new ailment that was observed to be going through the population in the United States, it was first determined to be a Haitian disease only because among the early people who had tested positive for this disease were a few Haitians. And very quickly, that period of time, the conversation was Haitians, and that caused a lot of pain and pseudoscience until it became known that it was a human condition, not confined to any geographical location or any demographic coming from a geographical location. So when I hear mm -hmm. talk about Venezuelans, it's easy to say, but it is not supported Correct. by the fact. Because we do have, we have 16,000 Venezuelans in Trinidad and Tobago. I would be surprised if they are immune to this virus. And of course, they may be living in conditions. That's another thing that we have to be cognizant of. The virus has a certain kind of propensity to move in the, certain, in the conditions within which certain people live. If you're following the international news, you will see that. And it is saying that it is those persons who are in the worst living conditions who are having the worst ravages of the virus. And immigrant populations tend to be in that category. So let us stay with the facts. We will not hesitate to tell you if it is that our source of the, the problem of keeping the curve high is Venezuelans. But it is not supported by fact. Right? We have neighbors in Venezuela. We have Brazilians down south of us. We have <coughs> Central Americans. We have Caribbean people. As I told you, the meeting we had yesterday was a whole day of how can, what we were hoping to achieve yesterday was to create a bubble where our Caribbean island people, CARICOM people, could begin to move among ourselves. We could not come to that conclusion because the circumstances didn't permit it. Uh, we, would, we would love to come to a conclusion where let us create a bubble. Trinidad, Tobago, Grenada, Barbados, and Fusha have a CARICOM movement. We could not come to that conclusion because it's a human condition. So I stole my question. Um, you made mention of the word intervene, and the police officers can intervene in both private and public. Um, could you clarify what intervene means, specifically because the, the minister, sorry, not the minister, the commissioner of police was saying that he could have intervened at the show of side, but he could not have um, arrested. Well, what do you mean by intervene? All right, well, I mean, 
first of all, I, the commissioner of police wasn't involved in that operation as far as I was concerned. The law is that any police officer has a power of arrest. Any police officer that sees or has reasonable grounds to suspect there's about to be a breach of the peace or someone's life put in danger, someone's life put at risk, they can intervene into that scenario and do what needs to be done to protect life. In a pandemic situation such as the one we're facing and, and as we've spent the last hour plus here discussing and we're all aware of, it is the spread of a virus that is potentially deadly. We have been implementing a number of things. Don't gather, be socially distanced, be socially distanced, um, you know, pr pr practice certain protocols so as to not spread the virus. So if there's a risk of that taking place, and this is a discussion, so parties in areas, the police can use that power of intervention. There's no magic in the word intervention. I mean to literally get into the situation and do not do what needs to be done. I wasn't there. I don't know the circumstances as to what took place. But police, as you know, have powers of arrest. I mean, you, you have it all the time. One of the things we've discussed throughout, for example, with the bar setting, is I've asked the police, if you see people congregating, breaching the, the, the protocols to get to the, sorry, the regulations, ask people to disperse. If they don't disperse, then arrest them. So it's, it's, it's that type of setting. Whilst I have, have the mic, Prime Minister, I'm just being told that a message has been sent here. 259 tickets have been issued for persons not wearing their masks, right? That's the figure. There's just one other point I'd like to raise because persons are asking about it. Permanent residents, we want all permanent residents who are stuck outside to know that we're not going to revoke your permanent residence because you haven't been able to get back here within the space of the year. I'm giving the instructions to the Immigration Department as the Minister of National Security that what I shall be doing is, is having a sort of amnesty because we recognize persons couldn't get back here, the borders were closed, so you don't need to worry as you haven't been able to get back in, within the space of a year, you're going to lose your permanent residence. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, going to the judgment, part of it, there was an advice that the parliament... Well, you can ask me that as the minister, you can ask me that as short young of counsel. Yes. <laughs> that the parliament be involved in um, or have some sort of okay. oversight. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes, the media and other persons grabbed onto that sentence of the judge. It is what we call in, in legal jargon, obata. So it is not the decision of the court. It wasn't a factor that was determined by the court in that um, case. What the court was saying, and when you read the context as to where the court got there, the court was saying, listen, you have to be cautious about using regulations to establish criminal offenses. And if you're going to use regulations to establish criminal offenses, it should really be part of Parliament. However, not in these circumstances. So the court recognized that with the public health ordinance, and I think he quoted cholera and yellow fever in the past, it can be used, and it was rightly used. So he's not saying that now, as we're about to publish today new regulations, we should go to the Parliament under the public health ordinance. He's saying just be careful, and in the future give consideration if there are other pieces of legislation where you have the power to pass regulations, don't go about passing criminal offenses attached to those regulations. Those are things you should always be cautious about and, and maybe put it before parliamentarians for debate. But it was not linked to the present public health ordinance regulations. So will you be taking the advice to and going to parliament? But, but he, I, I just explained or tried to explain it doesn't apply to here. I mean, when you read the judgment, the court actually recognizes that in these circumstances, an executive needs to move expeditiously. He actually complimented the government, saying that you can see that there's constant review taking place by the number of times they've, we, the government, have amended the regulations and are taking the advice of the, the public health care experts. And he found all of that to be proper. So that one sentence that was grabbed onto is not applicable in the present circumstances. But Minister, so since you've given us a little bit of legal advice, right? right. What, what is the protocol <coughs> should any member of cabinet be infected with COVID-19, have to quarantine, have to be treated as hospital, are they still fit to work? The, the, the answer is yes. I mean, there, yeah. there, there, there is no difference, as the Prime Minister said, as he said a hundred times from the pulpit, so to speak. And I'll use the opportunity to, to, to repeat it, because I said it in my last contribution, Parliament. 
COVID doesn't respect your race, it doesn't respect your creed, your religion, your age, your social stature, how much money you have in the bank or you don't have in the bank, where you come from. So if any member of cabinet, and it is always possible, contracts COVID, we are then in the hands of the CMO and, and his health experts, and, and we will be treated as such. Let me, just, let me just say, that we, we, there's no need for us to make these separations here because we've already had in Trinidad and Tobago, the, the, the highest office holder has responded by being quarantined in response to an exposure. The president responded. We've had a head of state who had COVID and died already in the world. We've had a head of a major nation go through the hospital care for COVID. So uh, there's, no, there, there's no difference between an office holder and John Public in the street where this is concerned. I understand that, um, but I was not asking about how they would be treated. I was asking about would you still be able to perform your function as a member of cabinet while in quarantine or being treated for COVID-19? Well, let me answer that. <laughs> we tell people, if you feel sick, stay at home. Okay? That ailment that you are, exp that, that, that sickness that you're feeling and you stay at home in response to the CMO's directive, could be that you have COVID. It also says that if, you, if your condition is such that you are concerned about it, contact the health department. If your condition worsens, contact the health department. But if not, just stay at home for the 14-day period. Eh? So let's assume, God forbid, that I don't feel well tomorrow and I am following the instructions. You don't feel well, stay at home. Well, you know, whilst I'm at home, um, I do a lot of work on the phone, <laughs> so I can do that still. I have to stay away from you. I have to stay away from my colleagues here and even my family, my colleagues. Um, a lot of work goes on at the residence of the Prime Minister. So, yes, it depends on the level yeah. of your ill health. If you are, I saw... Um, one of my a former parliamentarian was um, yeah. in the Two hospital, and a former colleague of mine was hospitalized. So it depends. But the, it, if you test positive and you're put to home quarantine, if you are not um, physically distraught and distressed, you may be able to continue. If you can't, well, then there's a provision for that. You then will have to be replaced. And what happens there is that the president is informed that the minister cannot function and someone would be made to act for that person. That is, um, is that normal? Recently we had one cabinet minister who had to have okay. medical procedure done and that was done. That's, that's the protocol. If, once you are in a position not to be able to function at all, then you are replaced by a person to act for you. Okay. And, um, in your opinion, Prime Minister, you'll be getting feedback how has this work from home thing and rotation been working out so far, especially in public service? And are there any plans to continue that post-COVID? I, I hope so, because what has happened is that a certain amount of efficiency has been brought to bear on um, the carrying out of public business using the technology. For example, we... To have a CARICOM meeting, we usually have to pack a bag, get to the airport, get to a hotel, we all get together, and that usually was a three-day thing, a one-day travel, a one-day meeting, and a one-shot. That, that was three days. Now, we're having meetings as frequently as um, as required, probably a little too frequently, <laughs> because all you need to do is to order a meeting. And it goes very, very well, and it's very efficient. And I expect that the same thing is happening in areas where um, the technology is utilized. That being so, when we get back to normal, it is to be expected that those developments would factor in, especially here in Trinidad and Tobago, where even before COVID, we were aiming to become more technologically advanced. We are, we, steps have been taken, you would have seen the cabinet being adjusted, you would have heard certain things being done for us to become 
more attached to and attuned to the use of technology in public administration and governance of the country. And I have every confidence that when this is all over, one of the things that you will see is a continuation of a lot of the positives that arose in response to the COVID. You know, when President Kennedy said that man was going to go to the moon, a lot of people thought that that was just something to do. First a dog went into space, and then man is going to go on the moon, something to do. But if you ever had the opportunity to look and see what happened with respect to technological advance in response to the moon program, it is absolutely amazing, you know, what has been discovered and put to use and is now commonplace because it came up in the space program. And I think the same thing is going to happen with COVID-19. I have a question for CMO, but I don't have a chance to ask. CMO? <laughs> Sorry, I take advantage of having more than two questions. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Would you be in a position to state how many, or have we had any instances of patients of St. Anne's testing positive for COVID-19? Yes. And I'm hearing a rumor that one of them may have escaped. I don't know if you could okay. uh, put that to rest. So, so there were patients in, in the facility that tested positive. Um, I had spoken to the chief, uh, chief executive officer regarding it, and they have a team comprising of the chief of staff, as well as the infection prevention control department, as well as OSH ensuring that there's no spread in that facility further. Of course, prior to getting the positive, there would have been some contacts, so all of those persons would be treated as primary and secondary contacts, as per usual, but that is being managed by the Chief Executive Officer of Northwest Regional Health Authority. And also, I would have instructed Chief Executive Officer, and they have already found it, mm -hmm. a site within the compound, so any um, person with uh, mental illness can be housed away from the general population of St. Anne's, and any other mental patient from throughout the country can be brought to that central location so they don't mix with the general St. Anne's patient population. Okay, and now, I know the ministry is trying its best to deal with that backlog of tests, but right. as it stands, we're seeing, and I've gotten numerous calls, numerous calls from people being affected by it, yeah. right? For instance, one person called me today and said that their father had a heart attack in that Tampanado General Hospital, but the swab was taken as a precaution, and the, the family was told that they now need to see a, a procedure that needs to be done privately, but that backlog is preventing them from getting that done. So what contingencies are being put in place in light of this backlog? Right, so in terms of what has, what has happened since I spoke last on the issue, we have gotten into the country. I know Minister would have said we got about 8,000 plus Abbott kits. We got the consumables in the middle of the week. So we have three additional sites, North Central, the MRFTT, as well as Southwest. So that particular patient would benefit from Southwest. Having their own capacity, they can do at least 200 tests per day. And they have so far done about 280 within the last couple of days that they have been working. So they can, for, for the entire Southwest Regional Health Authority now, they have the capacity to do those tests on their own without sending it up to Trinidad Public Health Lab and going to another lab. So the national capacity has gone from somewhere about 600, just over 600 per day, to 12, 1,287. So our swabs coming in per day, roughly about 700. So we have a surplus in terms of capacity at this point. With that being the case, we hope, of course, going forward into the next couple of weeks, we'll be in a much better place to respond in a timely manner. If you have noticed, even in the updates, we, we sort of decreased to about five to seven days in terms of the response and the way we are, we are dealing with the backlogs that occurred. But we're hoping as the numbers continue to increase with our increased numbers, meaning that the, the swab numbers remain the same as well, we hopefully that will either stay the same or go down, then our capacity will be such that we will be able to manage. Let me just go back to the Southwest situation. We did actually activate the Southwest PCR machine two days ahead of schedule. Mm -hmm. So we started it on Wednesday. That is the only thing that happened before time. Um, they are doing 94 per day on one run. We are taking our time, and by next middle of next week, we'll start to do two runs per day, and then hopefully three runs per day. So let's say every run is about 100, 94 to 100. So right now we have done 280 
282, 288, that will go up in the coming weeks, okay? Uh, would you be in a position to say uh, the antigen rapid kits that we were getting, uh, we did not get an exact date of when we expected yeah. it to come. Do, do you have a... So I can't date? give you an exact date. We have to wait on the manufacturer. It's in a production line now. As soon as I have a, a concrete date, I'll bring that to you. I have a question for everybody on the table. Uh, start with the CMO. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, CMO, could you give us a, a, a ball by ball what happens after someone dies? Um, from COVID-19. Well, I, I have been avoiding, to be honest, going up ball by ball because of the nature of what happens after someone dies from COVID-19. Suffice it to say, there has been a guideline in place since March, which the funeral agencies are aware of, the heads of pathology are aware of, and all the hospitals that treat COVID-19 are aware of as well. So I will, I will leave it at that. The guidelines are available. I don't want to go into the details because I don't think the details for the families that have lost loved ones would help them any at this point. So we leave that for the guidelines. I'm told that families have no choice in uh, the funeral home that, that does the burial or cremation. There's an assignment based on the RHAs. So the RHAs would have had a list of, they would have met with the funeral agencies to determine who had the capacity to, to meet with the criteria set out in the guideline to ensure that the proper protocols can be followed. And the RHAs, mainly North Central Regional Health Authority, together with some others, I think Southwest, would have been putting things in place through their normal procurement process to, to get those agencies. But those agencies are the agencies that will have to deal with the COVID-19 bodies. Not every agency can do it and do it at a standard that we are happy with at this point. And who puts the bill, the government or the family? I think the RH, I believe the RHA, Minister, I, I don't know. I believe it should be the RHA, but we can get back to you on that one. We have five minutes from two hours, so uh -huh. I would like to wrap up at, uh -huh. on two hour mark. So we have five minutes more, so if you have one two-minute question, yes. we can get two of those and then we'll be out in two hours. Health Minister, have you received the um, pre-action protocol letter from uh, one of the families who died from COVID? So I will continue to tell the country that anybody who has COVID can be guaranteed that the Minister of Health will not discuss any family's private business in the public domain. Let the course of action that any family wants to take place happen, but as Minister of Health, I have. Health is based on patient confidentiality, and I will not be bre breaching that from prince to pauper. Uh, so let's have the last question. In the years gone by, we've seen uh, national security take up um, the majority of the budget. Do you foresee the health aspect of it? Um, up. <laughs> I'll ask you to be patient until the 5th of October. I can guarantee to you that the Minister of Finance and his team, they are at work. They have been in contact with the Office of the Prime Minister and elements of the Cabinet. There's a lot of work to be done between now and then, and I'm sure on that day you'll get the answer. And just let me, let me end on this note. A few years ago, I was in a as someone in, uh, in the mid western side of the United States, I was working on a volcano there, and I came to town, went to a party, and I'm, I'm speaking to the person who asked about what police intervening means. I was in this party, and there was a good party going on, music was playing, and a lot of good people around, and all of a sudden, the music, the music stopped. And I looked, and I saw the organizer of the party by the door talking to a police officer. And I walked towards the door, and the officer by the gate spoke to me inside the house saying, you go back. And I was close enough to hear him telling the organizer of the party that there was a complaint from the neighbors that there was loud music being played in this house. And if this party is not wrapped up in five minutes, I'm taking everybody down. And here I was from Trinidad in a party somewhere in New Mexico, I don't know where I was, didn't even know whose party it was, and I was in line to be taken down. And I'm sure that would have made headline here in Trinidad to be good, right? So intervention means law enforcement for public, for public purpose. And we are all now subject to the public health ordinance because we are in a public health emergency. I thank you for coming and I thank you for listening. Thank you very much. We've all had our share of bad luck. 
be it unlucky in love or backing the most unlucky team ever. Whatever your run of bad luck is, the KFC Lucky 7 Bucket makes it 